Well, good morning. It is great to see you guys. So today, uh, you know, we love to see the enemy in these movies outwitted. And the neat thing about the story of Esther is today we kind of see the enemy get prideful and he gets more and more arrogant and then God humbles him. And here's the thing for us, and I was thinking about this on the way to church this morning. Uh, for many of us, the enemy to us is not a person. Um, for some of us, it's something we're dealing with. Uh, some of you may be dealing with health issues. Some of you may deal, be dealing with mental health issues, depression, um, discouragement. Um, for some of you, it may be family strife or conflict, or you don't know what to do about something, and that's your enemy. It's the thing that's overwhelming you. Um, it could even be something as simple as rejection that you've always carried around, and you just kind of naturally... You know, do that. So today, the number one thing I'm going to tell you, if you miss everything else, and you'll get this, Doug, and then you can take a nap. So trust, you're lucky Carrie's not here this morning, because second, second service, I'll harass it. Trust and obey God, even when life is hard. And so if you'll trust and obey God, he's going to walk you through. And that's why we get to the end of the story, and we're going to talk about he he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. But guess what? We have enemies. You know, the Bible says no weapon formed against you will prosper. I wish it said there was no weapon formed against you. Um, the truth is sometimes you can hear the knives being sharpened. You, you feel the discouragement. You feel the overwhelming press of whatever it is that you feel like is coming after you. Uh, so have you ever felt dumb? So when I went to Palm Beach Atlantic College, which is now university, thank you, go sailfish, go fish. All right, so um, we, we also, by the way, one of our parents, their daughter, that goes here to church, their daughter was on one of the billboards uh, on the main street in, uh, in Orlando, or in, excuse me, in West Palm, so anyway. So when I first went to Palm Beach Atlantic, they would bring the freshmen in, and they would bring the freshmen in for orientation, and uh, uh, they, would, they would sit you in a room, and they used to give us what I called Gilligan hats. You know what I'm talking about? Those little sailor hats. It's the most embarrassing, but everybody like, had to wear them, and so I think it was like hazing. But anyway, so we're wearing these dumb hats, and they're doing activities with us. Well, all of a sudden, Jennifer Rothschild, um, who, who now travels all over the place and speaks and everything, but she was at our college, and she was doing the music that day, and so she was going to do a fun song, and she pointed at me and said, come forward, you're going to teach everyone the hand motions to this song. Now, what I understand now or know about myself and what she didn't know about me was, you can't tell me more than one thing. You tell me one thing, I can catch the one thing. You tell me three things, you get no things. And so she says, you know, we're going to sing, and they changed it to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, Oh, baby, let my people go. Huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if you ever heard that version of it, but that's how it went. And so I was supposed to do all these hand motions, which even though Michelle showed me the hand motions last night, she showed me more than one at a time. So I don't know. What's the first one? Pharaoh, Pharaoh. So I was supposed to go Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Oh, oh baby. baby, let my people go. Huh. Yeah, 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 or whatever. All right, so there's all these hammers. I, so I got up there. I couldn't remember any of them. Felt like a doofus. But here's what's funny about it. Everyone thought I was doing it on purpose. I literally was just making up whatever I heard to, to the best of my ability, like what I thought Pharaoh Pharaoh was. So I think I did a head thing or whatever. I was just making stuff up, right? And so we leave there, and I walk to the back of the room just devastated. This was like the end of the thing. And four girls came up to me and said, Do you want to go to the dollar movies with us? Because they figured I was funny, not stupid. And, and so I said yes, and I'll never forget this. We went to the dollar movies where every person from the college was already there, and I walked in with four girls like I was some kind of cool, and people thought, he's the coolest guy here. 
It was like the biggest turn of events ever. If they had any idea that number one, I really had no idea. Number two, I really wasn't that cool. I was just ridiculous. And so it was such a big turn of events, and it was, and really, I would say that it impacted the rest of my college life. Now, here's the thing I will say to you. This celebration that, that the Jews have every year, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong, I'm a hillbilly, forgive me, I can't say naked, and I can't say Purim, and so I don't know how to actually pronounce it, but it's spelled Purim, and you figure it out. But anyway, so every year they celebrate Esther and this. Because what starts to happen here is such a huge shift how God is going before the Jewish people, how he is taking care, even though other people are trying to destroy them. Gosh, this sounds familiar. Uh, He's going before them and taking care of them. You ready for this? Like he always does. And so we're going to pick up today with number one, how God prepares us during tough times. And I want you to think of something tough you're dealing with today, whether it's a situation, a person, a difficulty, a job situation, a home situation, a health situation, whatever it is, I want you to kind of make that, okay, God, I'm going to look at this today, this story, and I'm going to apply that to this circumstance. So number one, we need to recognize that God uses, listen, ordinary people and moments. So I'm going to talk about that, but let's get there. Esther 6, 1 through 4. That night, the king could not sleep. Now, we're talking about Xerxes. A lot of history on Xerxes. You can Google it and find out all kinds of things. Um, Remember that Xerxes' enemies wrote the history books. So if you watch the movie 300, they actually make him look worse than he is. But he was pretty bad. You, You would not vote for him. Let's just say that, okay? And so that night, the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. I love this. The guy can't sleep. So he's like, read me Leviticus. You know, and by the way, some of you who've read through the Bible get there and you're like, I totally get that. Okay? He said, bring in the history books. Now you know why your coaches all taught history, right? Because nobody else wanted to teach it. So here we go. So, so he brings in the history books and then it says, so he can't sleep and he still can't sleep. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh Two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. By the way, years later, somebody was successful. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this, the king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. By the way, this is like having somebody read their greatest hits. You realize that's what King Xerxes King Xerxes is like, tell me about myself. Can you read this? And they start reading it, and he's like, this guy saved your life. And so it says, nothing has been done for him, his attendants answers. Then the king said, who's in the court? Now Haman, God loves irony, by the way. Haman had just entered the outer course of the palace to speak to the king. Listen, listen. About impaling Mordecai on the pole he had set up for him. So think about this. Here comes Haman. Haman is excited. He, you know, remember he was telling his family, the king has everybody bowing to me. Look how awesome I am. But this guy drives me crazy. So he says, they said, build a pole. So he builds the pole. He writes the name, I'm guessing, Mordecai on the pole. Like it's ready to kill him. By the way, some of your translations might say gallows, and that's a very loose translation. It's a much worse death than gallows, right? So, so here's the thing. So it says that he comes in, what? And he's all excited about telling the king about what's going to happen. But what had God done? Remember that the people were all praying and fasting. And I'm sure in the middle of those prayers that they were praying for evil King Xerxes, who wanted to have them all killed, who had signed a document that said, you can kill all the Jews on this day. And so I believe that God has him wake up in the middle of the night, wide awake. Why? To find this out. God has put everything in place. I can almost see God saying to Michael, um... Yeah, go wake that guy up. Wake him up. Let's let him sleep. Every time he's awake, he does something dumb. No, no, no. Wake him up. 
And so Xerxes is awake, whether he's arguing, whether he's fighting his conscience or what, we don't know. But as he's read the history, what does he do? He discovers that Mordecai, who he has unknowingly condemned to death, saved him. And then here comes Haman. Listen to what it says. I love this. 1 Corinthians 1.27. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. This is how good God does is. He can even use an evil purpose to help, person to help accomplish his purpose. That's how good God is. He, he can go out of his way to even take a Xerxes who in all uh, uh, aspects was an evil person and God can even use that. Now I love this because this word for foolish here is the word that Bugs Bunny would say. What a maroon! It, it's where we get the word moron from. And so it says God uses maroons and makes other people realize that their wisdom means nothing compared to God's wisdom. Here comes Haman walking in the door going, man, my life is going great. And God's like, mm-hmm. You don't realize I just woke up the king. Never discount, by the way, in your own life, waking up in the middle of the night. You ever wake up and you're stressed out and freaked out? I want to encourage you, anytime you wake up in the middle of the night, to turn that around a lot of people wake up with anxiety, frustrations, everything you forgot during the day, uh, your greatest hits of failures play, right? You have that evil DJ that plays, greatest hits of the dumbest thing you've ever done. How about dancing in college? Go! Oh, man. During that time, I want to encourage you to pray. And the other thing I would tell you, if you're going through a very emotional time or struggle, maybe it's a physical struggle, maybe you're dealing with somebody... The Psalms are one of the greatest books to read when you, are, when you are in the midst of struggle and trial. When you're going through something and you don't know how to express yourself, the Psalms, David's not the only one who wrote, but any of the Psalms that, that give the passion of what's happening, the hurt, the pain, the struggle, sometimes just a verse from there can help us. You know what? I'm not alone in this struggle. Number two, so not only does God use ordinary people and moments, number two, God provides favor during fear. Favor during fear. It's in the times when you're struggling that God may just use you to be a blessing to somebody else. One of the things that I can tell you is some of the things that you have been through and walked through, it could be that God will even allow you to use that. He will use even that hurt to help someone else on their journey. So never discount the pain, the struggle, the frustration you're going through. Now remember, as we pick up this part of the passage, that Mordecai is grieving. He's feeling guilty about everything that happened. He's, he's knowing that his family's about to be killed. Because of Haman, because he, remember, he would not stand and bow to Haman. And here's what happens next. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? You talk about pride and arrogance. The king had already passed a law that anybody who he saw would bow to him. Is that not enough? I mean, when he walked in a room, everybody had to say, oh, he's here, he's here. And that wasn't enough. And he said, surely the king is talking about me. <laughs> and so I love this part. So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe to the king has worn and the horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest on its head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted Listen to this, to one of the king's most noble princes. Little does he know, he thinks he's going to be on the horse. He gets to be the noble prince. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor, lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man who the king delights to honor. Basically, what he's saying to the king is, let them be king for the day. Let them ride on your horse, let them wear your stuff, let them be proclaimed. You make them king for the day. So 
So I'm sure this next sentence horrified him. Haman's like, oh no. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Don't neglect anything you've recommended. Can you imagine? That had to be a, oh no, moment. God had set everything in place. God uses weak people, foolish people, being awake at night, all kind of little things. Listen, never underestimate being awake at night and God putting somebody on your heart that you need to text or call, not in the middle of the night, the next day. <laughs> somebody that you need to check on, somebody that you need to be a blessing to, somebody that you need to say, are you doing okay? I haven't seen you in a while. Never underestimate those little God prompts that he gives you sometimes in the middle of the night to show you how you can be used. You ever heard of a God wink? A God wink is one of those times where God shows himself true no matter what you're going through. Maybe you're going through a really hard time and you're like, God, how is this going to work out? And it's just those moments where God gives you a surprise blessing. Maybe it's a phone call from a friend, a text from a friend. Maybe it's a special sunset or a sunrise. Maybe it's some gift that you didn't expect or a card or whatever. It can be anything, but look for those God winks. Somebody told me that word a couple years ago and I thought, what a great word for a moment where even in the middle of struggle, God sometimes just gives you a little hint. It's going to be okay. Even though God hasn't taken care of the big picture, his family's about to be killed. And yet, what does God do? I'll show him that it's going to be okay. How about a ride on a horse? By your enemy. Can you imagine? This is the same guy who yelled at him for not standing up and bowing is now the same guy leading him around going, this is the one who the king honors. And his, his friends, all their, both of their friends had to be like, what? What is going on? What kind of crazy pills are these guys taking? That's how good God is. So don't be surprised that even in the middle of your struggle, God gives you a wink to let you know, I'm still with you. I'm still with you as you go through this trial, as you go through this difficulty, as you go through this struggle. Don't forget, I'm with you. And if he needs to, he'll put you on the back of a horse and have your enemy yell, here they come. Or he'll send you a kind person to let you know it's going to be okay. Or a friend to pray for you. Ask God that you would pay attention to those little winks he might give you. Listen to what it says in James 4, 6. I love this. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So remember in this place, Haman comes in and he's like, whoa, and he's just more and more prideful, more and more arrogant. And what does God do? He humbles him. And so we all have to get to the place where we say, God, I need more grace. This word for grace, I love it because it's an 80s word. And what I mean by that is it's where we get the word mega. And in the 80s, if you didn't know it, people would just randomly, especially in South Florida, I don't know about up here, but they would just say mega out of nowhere. Like, dude, that's mega. What does that have to do? Now they just talk about sharks on Netflix with mega. But, but back then, it would just be mega. It just meant huge. And so this verse says, God gives us mega grace. And I think sometimes we have to say to God, God, you know what I need? Mega grace. I'm going through this struggle, this trial. I talked to a pastor friend this week who's had some major health issues. And he was feeling guilty about some things. And I said to him, listen, just do what God wants you to do. Don't do any more. Don't do any less. And let him take care of it. I love what Charles Stanley says. Obey, or said, obey God and leave the consequences to him. So just obey God as you go through things. Let God speak to you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, I believe that God will give us all the strength we need to help us resist in all times of distress. But he never gives it in advance, lest we should rely on ourselves and not on him alone. Number three, 
God shows our enemies our blessing. So what do we do? We keep trusting God when life's hard. You know, over the years, my mom has been a great example. My mom will turn 90 years old this Tuesday. Yeah, she didn't. She used to tell us goodbye at 80, just so you know. It's really funny. My brother and I always talk about that. But, but the truth is, over the years, I've seen my mom go through all kind of stuff. I've seen her deal with pastors who did all kind of crazy stuff, business associates of my dad who cheated our family out of money, all that stuff. And over the years, my mom would just say, we just keep going. Family tragedy, horrible tragedies in our family, we just keep going. We just keep going. We just keep doing what God wants to do. Why? Because God is the one who will take care of that enemy. I used to talk to Harold about that, and I'm like, Harold, can I at least post something mean about them? And Harold would look at me and go, Eric, don't worry about them. Just focus on God and do what he wants you to do. Quit thinking about them. God will take, let God take care of them. So sometimes in our lives, we just have to say, God, I can't fix that, but you can. Listen to what happens next. I love this. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai. Now listen to that. He's actually dressing Mordecai. Mordecai has to be like, what in the world? And led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what's done for the man the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief, grief, and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, everything that had happened to him. Now listen to what this next sentence is. His advisors and Zeresh said to him, uh, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish orient, uh, origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. Basically, they looked at him and said, Oh man, you are in trouble. You ought to stay away from that guy. Stay away from the palace. Stay away from the king. You are in trouble. And listen to the next sentence. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried, to me that almost sounds like dragged Haman, <laughs> away to the banquet Esther had prepared. His family just looked at him and said, oh, you are in trouble. God has your number. Gotta go. Come on, we're going. And next week we'll talk about what happens at that banquet. But here's the truth. If you seek revenge, if you seek for life to be fair and for you to get even, you will be miserable. But if you just seek God and you seek doing God's will, listen, God will take care of your enemies. And not only that, God will take care of you and make your enemies watch because that's what he does. Just let him take care of you. Say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to be obedient to you. Now, if you pursue getting even with everybody else, being mad about how life is unfair, whatever you want to be mad, then you're going to be miserable. But if you'll say, God, I don't know why this is happening, but I'm going to trust and obey you in the middle of it. I'm going to let that person, I'm just going to forgive that hurt. By the way, forgiveness and hanging around somebody are two different things. Don't mix those up. Okay. If, a, if, a car, if you go to a car shop and they ruin your car, forgiveness doesn't mean taking it back to them, okay? But it means saying, God, I'm not going to hold that. I'm going to let go of that. I'm going to let you deal with it. And here's what it says in Psalms 23. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And if you put these two verses together, this verse together, here's what it means. God is Jesus, think about this, Jesus serving you dinner. Your enemies are watching, but not only is he serving you dinner, you know what head with oil is? That's him healing you. Oil represented healing and anointing. God is healing you. When you don't get hung up on whatever's going wrong in your life, whatever's unfair in your life, whatever difficulty you're facing, when you just say, God, I'm just going to be obedient to you, and if I perish, I perish. There'll be a day that Jesus will serve you dinner, and your enemies will have to watch. That may happen on this earth, and it may not. 
But that's what he does. That's all through Scripture. It happens over and over again where God's blessings will come on you. So what enemy are you facing today? What enemy is overwhelming you? What struggle right now just feels like you're under it instead of over it? It's time to say, God, instead of focusing on that, I'm going to focus on you. I'm going to obey you. Leave the consequence to you, Lord, and just do what you've called me to do. And let him take care of the enemies in your life. Let him take care of the preparation for what comes next. And next week, by the way, it's a great sermon. It's going to be fun next week to see what happens next. Because God always, always works out the details. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what that means. We're going to have our offering first and then I'll be here. And you can come and say, Eric, I need prayer. If you're here and you're a Christian and you're struggling with one of the things I talked about, it's okay. We all struggle. And sometimes we let things go and then we pick them back up and walk out the door with them again. So just lay it down. Surrender is what the Christian life's all about. So just surrender it back to him. Would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for this time this morning. I thank you for this story that reminds us, Lord, that you work things out in the end. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it. Lord, sometimes it feels like everybody's after us and that failure is ahead and struggle, it's never going to go away. But Lord, you are preparing a table for us. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, for that one today who's hurting in, in major ways, would you just give them your anointing oil? Would you let them know that they're going to be okay? Would you give them your strength to walk through whatever they're walking through this morning? Thank you for that. Thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.